I want to I want to just confront you now with the first passage that I flagged. It's on page one, mm -hmm. where I read it and I thought I thought, what are you saying? How can that be right? Now, by the end of the chapter, I came around a little bit more to your view, but maybe we can do a version of that live, as it were, for the uh, the, the audience here. So, here's the first sense of your book: human obsolescence is imminent. We are living through an era in which our activity is becoming less and less relevant to our well-being and to the fate of the planet. This trend toward increased obsolescence is likely to continue in the future, and so we need to prepare ourselves and our societies for this reality. And then ultimately, you'll argue that far from being a cause for despair, this is uh, in fact an opportunity for optimism, and we'll, we'll get into all that. But you know, when you read the sentence, our activity is becoming less and less relevant to our own well-being and the fate of the planet, somebody might say, what could you possibly mean by that? Um, you've got climate change that people are very concerned about. Our activity seems to be having wide reaching consequences for the planet and its fate. Um, so I'd, I'd hope you could address that. And I'll just flag that I, I, I gather through, through reading the rest of this chapter here that you're using obsolescence in a particular sense, almost a technical sense. So maybe you can first just um, help people understand what is the sense in which our, our activities could be construed as less relevant to you know, the welfare of the planet and of ourselves. And then how are, you, how are you using this term obsolescence? What does that mean when you say that that's imminent for, for our species? Yeah, look, I mean, that, that opening paragraph has struck many people who read the book and many people who have interviewed me about the book as kind of ridiculous or overstated. And I mean, there is an, a, an extent to which it is an exercise in kind of rhetorical hyperbole, kind of just to draw people in to prevent them with this provocative claim. So, I mean, you mentioned earlier that one of the things you like about some of the work that I do is that I put these provocative theses and by the end, hopefully people are come around to it or think it's slightly less absurd. Um, and uh, yeah, I probably do that a lot. And some people could view it as a gimmick as opposed to, or, you know, what should I, I don't mean to imply that imply that it's a gimmick. So you know, I'm not I'm not leading with the presumption that that's how we should interpret this. And and I think that yeah, the yeah. way you do end up spelling out obsolescence is a way that's plausible, uh, even though it's a term that could be interpreted different ways. So yeah, I don't mean to imply that, but I am curious if you know, given that this is how your opening gamut in the book, how how do you concern to, uh, respond to those concerns that people raise along those lines? Yeah, well, like one of the things I say in the paragraph immediately after the one that you just quoted is that 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 claim seems absurd given facts about climate change, given the fact that people often now refer to the era that we're currently living through as this, the Anthropocene, this term that's become part of the popular consciousness and popular debate recently. And it's supposed to capture this notion that humans have never been more relevant or more consequential in terms of their activities and the impact that it's having on the planet and the future of the, of the planet. And obviously that's, that's all true, I think. But I think in what's happening in terms of how we're, our activities are becoming less and less relevant, I think, is that we have now created a kind of techno-social infrastructure combining both our you know, social institutions and our technologies, internet, AI, robotics, and so forth, that is no longer sort of meaningfully within our control or has become a kind of a Frankenstein's monster in a sense that we have created and that we have less directional guidance over. So that's the kind of sense that I'm trying to capture there in that, that opening paragraph, the, the sense that we we're becoming less relevant in terms of the guidance and control we have over, over the future. In terms of obsolescence, you're right that I use that in a, a slightly technical ser or sense. So some people will conflate it or view it as the same thing as somehow humans are obsolete, we're no longer relevant or, or useful. And that's not exactly what I mean. Is What I mean by obsolescence is that we're in the process or state of decline. We're, we're entering a, a phase when we're becoming less and less relevant to, again, the, the fate of the planet and the, the, the fate of our peers as well. Um, but I mean, I, like I've, I've written another paper, which is all about the, the concept of obsolescence I wrote it after the book. And one of the things that I explore in, in that uh, book is different conceptions or senses of obsolescence. And like one thing I, I will say to qualify the statement I made in the book, or at least add some nuance to it, is that I don't think it's possible for humans to be what I would call generally obsolescent. That, in the sense that they're, they're not relevant to anything at all. We're always relevant to one another or to our own lives in some sense. There's always some sense of significance or relevance that will apply to humans but we might be less and less relevant or useful given certain kind of social norms. So for example, this is one of the main theses in the book. If it's the case that 
our society has been set up in such a way that the only way in which people can make a meaningful or valuable contribution to social life and to build a sense of self-worth is through having paid employment. And if that goes away, then we're obsolescent kind of relative to the ideology or normative structure of the society in which we live. And that's a problem. Yeah. Okay. So I want to turn to that issue of uh, unemployment, technologically induced uh, unemployment as the next question. But maybe just to reflect on what you said, it seems like this Frankenstein's monster analogy that you raised might kind of reconcile these, the, the, the more nuanced interpretation of, of us becoming obsolete and the seemingly shocking claims. So um, if humans release a whole bunch of Frankenstein's monsters through technology and other kinds of things that then have the capacity to themselves have uh, a significant effect on the planet in, in concert with other factors, then there's a sense in which the humans are ultimately responsible for creating this techno-social world that has all these kinds of things, creating the monster that then is outside of their control. But it seems like what you're talking about is the obsolescence has to do with the control, with, with the sense that you can still uh, directly kind of uh, conduct the way that things play out once it's the case that technology is sufficiently autonomous and sufficiently self-reproducing and so forth. Is that yeah, fair? I mean, like, this is a kind of a long-standing claim in philosophy of technology, and I'm going to forget the name of the author who came up with it, but uh, it's usually referred to kind of as the control problem when it comes to technology. People like Nick Bostrom and his work on superintelligence have maybe popularized this notion to a greater extent. But uh, one thing that people say is that, that there's a point in time when we do have a, maybe more control over the technologies that we create. But at that point in time, we're often less aware of the consequences that they will have. And by the time we become aware of the consequences, we often have less control over them. And we're always kind of constantly dancing around that kind of paradox that we don't know enough to know whether we need to control this phenomenon. And then by the time we do know enough, it's too late to do anything about it. And I think we're kind of at that point, and this is one of the arguments that I make in relation to um, in, in relation to kind of technological unemployment that uh, the, the horse has to some extent already bolted and a lot of the policy proposals or suggestions that people make to rein it in or slow it down are too late. As somebody actually just mentioned in the chat there, I just saw it popping up on the screen that the name of that dilemma or paradox is Colin Ridge's dilemma. Yeah. So thanks, Henrik, for that. Crowdsourcing the, uh, the citations for our claims here.